I'd say that would require any of us to have seen any of it. <laughs> oh my god, I haven't missed an episode. I don't know how this is going to go. This is the biggest pod. We've done this twice now with four people. One time it was really easy to tell who was who. And right. This time is going to be chaos, I think. But let's try it anyway. Welcome back. We were gamers. I'm Andrew. And JJ's I'm JJ. here. Yep, there he is. Michael's with us again. How's it going? And we have a guest on. Ryan, you're back to talk some Hearthstone. Always. <laughs> it's our go-to and i think we have to start there but welcome back everybody it's it's fun to have this many people and i'm a little nervous i'm hoping nothing technically goes wrong the more people you add it's like the more drives in a computer right yeah you just the, everything exponentially increases every time you add another layer yeah i'm a little bit like tech sweaty you know like when you boot up that pc for the first time uh anyway you're hoping you're hoping for that beep <laughs> Do we do we officially have enough people for a round table? We're not just a, a triangle at this point. I like to triumvirate before. Ooh, classy! I, I think we're at a square table here. You could just saw those little things off. I got the tools for that. And then it's a round. rounded, a rounded table. <laughs> I feel like we're getting into Battlestar territory here. Oh yeah, <laughs> just take the corners straight off. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Well, um We Were Gamers is talking about some updating of games. There was some big news that came out of Hearthstone this week. Big enough that it uh landed on everybody's lap, I think. Uh but I think that one of the two people that consistently play it should give a rundown of the balance changes and some ladder changes. Maybe balance first, JJ? Sure. Uh they announced some forthcoming balance changes in whatever the next Hearthstone patch is. Uh, they are changing some cards, which is always a big event in the Hearthstone universe. Uh, the four, there are four cards this time, which seems to be more than average, but I don't, I guess I'm not actually keeping score on that. So don't send corrections. <laughs> send corrections uh, to JJ. At- yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, so uh, the four cards are bone mare, which is a seven mana card is being increased to an eight mana card. Uh, but the effect still gives an, an another minion four plus four plus four in taunt, so that's still it's worse, but like not a lot worse. Uh, Bone Mare is a common, so that's a big deal, kind of. Uh, they're changing uh, Corridor Creeper, a, a perennial favorite in the current meta, which is a seven cost five five beast that reduces its cost every time a minion dies on board while it's in your hand. Uh, which frequently leads to it costing exactly zero mana all the time uh, and is really, really, really good in a whole bunch of decks. Uh, and that getting cha- is getting changed to, instead of changing anything about the card, they're just giving it two attack instead of five attack, which is a big, fat nerf. <laughs> that one got hit with a bat. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They they sent it to the Shadow Realm like in Yu-Gi-Oh!, uh, that's pretty bad, because uh, the card still costs seven mana if you draw it normally, and that's awful. Yeah, at least the trade-off before was you got a 5-5, five, five, it was like, eh. And, like, your hand is probably empty if you're going to consider playing it for seven, like, okay, I just get something. No, now you don't even want to play it. Um, so, yeah, that's done. Uh, the next card, and there are two other cards they announced changes to, which some people think is long overdue, and some people are like, okay, but Why? Uh, and one of them is Patches the Pirate, uh, the guy who tells you that he is in charge now every time he is played, uh, is losing his charge. <laughs> so he is no longer in charge. They already confirmed they dug up an alternate voice recording for him, so he'll say something different now. Really, though? Yeah, that was confirmed. Okay, that's, uh, wow, that's that's going the distance, actually. I did not expect them to do that. I mean, literally, I could just have somebody record a knot and stick it in there. <laughs> I'm not in charge. <laughs> that would have been way better, maybe. <laughs> so uh, does that does that make him patched the pirate? 
Oh, they should change his name to Patrick. They should Patrick. change his name. That would be really good. That would be ridiculous and awesome. I'm in the why now camp, but we should do the last card first. Yes, and the last card is uh, Raza the Unchained, a one of the Highlander cards. It's a five mana, five, five for Priest. Uh, I guess it's worth pointing out that all the previous cards were neutral, and this one's for Priest. Uh, and when you play it, it reduces the cost of your hero power to zero for the rest of the game. Uh, I thought the nerf they gave to this, which is to make your hero power cost one instead of zero, was pretty bad. I think there were a lot of changes they could have made that would have made more sense to me, uh, but this is the one they chose. All right, so you guys take on maybe Raza and uh, Corridor Creeper and the Bone Mare first, because I think those are semi-not controversial changes, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I, we could start with Raza really quick. Um, I, I assume you agree, Ryan, that it's good that he was changed. I, I mean, it's, it's one of those things. It's like, it, in a way, I think it's cool. In a way, I think it's whatever. The, the why now question is really important. Yes. yes. Like the card's been in the game since like, it's almost two years. Right. 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 Um, so obviously this and the patches change are clearly just being done for wild reasons. Right, which which is interesting, and and that's even what they say in their little like one paragraph explanation that oh we didn't think that these being around in wild forever would be great for the game, but it was okay for two years where they were in around in wild. So like I don't, I mean it obviously means that there's something the 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 design space argument they always use. So there's something else coming that they want you know to be able to play off with maybe in the Highlander sense that this is just too strong. Because, I mean, obviously, the the Raza Priest deck right now is just bananas, but it's bananas because of the combination of Raza and Anduin together. Yeah, I, and I was I didn't really understand why they went for the, oh, let's make it... I, I mean, maybe they're planning to do more stuff with hero powers or something, but the, you know, it could have changed this hero power, right, instead of every hero power, because... The thing that was powerful was you switch your hero power with the the Death Knight, right? So that your hero power does damage and you can refresh it all the time. Well, if it if that still costed two mana because you've changed your hero power from your base one, right? Or if it like it sets your base hero power to zero, I felt like that would be a lot less. But you know, like you said, maybe they're looking to experiment with inspired and, stuff or something and like, later. Like you're saying there, like I think in terms of a nerf, I think this is fine because it's going to be nerfed for. I mean, the deck is going to be demolished for one month before the next set comes out, but it doesn't kill the identity of the the Anduin Death Knight. So right. that card is still playable in the future, it's just not super overpowered. Right, and it's actually probably still worth playing in a Highlander deck, just because there aren't that many of those kind of effects and the body is good. I think you could run it in like a normal priest deck, and like some sort of tempo -y deck, like it's still playable. Like the, the yeah. refreshing of the hero power, even if it still costs two, money, two mana, is still very strong. Yeah, I, I just was, I, again, kind of the, like, why now, right? And, and the same argument um, with patches, which I guess we'll circle back around to. Um, but what about the uh, the Corridor Creeper, man? Everyone kind of slept on that guy during the, the release for this, and then it came out and everyone was like, oh, actually, this card is amazing and we should put it in every deck. I guess I guess I need to read the poem now, or the little riddle. Yeah, you should. It's pretty good. In the dungeon, I go deeper. In the set review, I was a sleeper. When minions die, I get cheaper. You guessed it right. I'm three attack weaker. <laughs> oh, no. That's a good pun. Did they change I, his voice line, too? It just has generic growling noises. I think oh. it's just some gurgles. Maybe, Yeah, maybe it should be more and more lucky now. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm just like... I'm happy they nerfed this card because it was getting kind of ubiquitous in every sort of deck that wanted to compete on tempo or on the board, which is every deck in Hearthstone mostly. It's one of those things where it's like, I don't think the card was necessarily that broken. And a lot of how strong it was, was amplified because of patches, because patches are so strong, everyone's running patches. So that's instantly a two mana reduction on the card. Right. Am I wrong that it wasn't even really a technically as strong as like a sludge belcher? Oh no! Th I mean, this card is this card is bananas when you play it for zero mana, because it just allows you like turn five playing it for zero mana with a cobalt scale bane is just ridiculous. Like that sort of 
yeah, pressure I, you can put on turn five. Yeah, it's so good to get a basically a five five body for free. And you could do it to enable, like, rogues were using it to enable all their combo pieces and stuff. So it's like you play this for five, or you play this for zero, you get a five, five, and then you get to play your combo card, uh, you know, to draw two minions out of your deck or whatever. And it was just, or use Vile Spine Slayer to murder their guy. So it's like you get a five, five, you get a three, four that kills anything on their side of the board for five mana. That's pretty good. And it's just, it's one of those cards where. The card is obviously strong and really good, and the issue may just be that it's too strong for a neutral. But, I mean, this this was, like I said, this was a Shadow Realm nerf. This was, you're never coming back to playability ever. So it's kind of, they obviously thought it was problematic and just wanted it gone rather than trying to balance it and make it 9 mana or 8 mana or something to make it right. so it's still playable with the same effect and usable. Because I think even if they moved it up to, like, 9 mana or something... I think people would still try to play this by playing, you know, a, a big aggro deck that floods the board. You draw and hold Corridor Creeper from the beginning of the game, and it eventually becomes free on turn five or whatever. So, yeah, this was, like you say, by only having two attack, no one wants to play this. Except for maybe, like, Evolve Shaman or something, at which point, like, there are better minions. Right. I mean, it's it's one of those things. I hate seeing cards just banished. Because it's more like this card is interesting and it creates different counterplay in a way, right? Because it right, punishes yeah. control decks for not putting pressure on the board and allows swing play, which is one of the things was missing in early games of Hearthstone where, you know, you're running an aggro deck, your board gets cleared once, the game is over. Yeah, and it actually combos really well in control decks with board wipes and stuff. So if you have like a big board wipe that you use to turn the game around, then all of a sudden, bam, you, you board wipe and then you play two one mana five fives and all of a sudden you're right back in the game. Right, which is probably ultimately the issue with the card is that it's usable in every deck, in every situation. Yeah, it's like, you. why wouldn't you include two of these? You just hold on to it early game and you get a free five five later. And like you say, that's the problem. So this kind of begs a bigger question, and it's how we're going to circle back to patches. I want to talk about mechanics, and it seems like we've now hit a stride where charge is done, right? Like, basically the only charge card they've added in the last two years that's at all worth using has now been nerfed before it heads into wild. Now this mana reduction uh, system, you know, they've always been trying to do mana reduction, and that's probably on its way out considering they didn't even try to balance the mana reduction on this card mana um inspire dead uh let's see discover kind of maybe not as popular as it was before in newer sets uh jade gone there's no seemingly stick around mechanics and it's something i've noticed in the game that kind of makes me a little bit worried for the future of it. If I think back and you see those card games get a huge pool of cards, bigger than Hearthstone has by a lot, with lots of different mechanics for each faction, lots of different mechanics that stick around for years, and, you know, like leaders and bigger cards that come around that start to play off these mechanics. And if they keep going away and they keep not trying to balance them, what's the point? Well, I think you're bringing up an interesting... Like the one interesting aspect I think Curstone needs to shift to, and I think you may actually see it come the first set, is more what you're talking about. Because Magic has the same rotations where every two years or whatever, you're losing, completely losing sets. Not even like the roll off that Hearthstone's having. Like it's completely new. But what they do is every rotation, they update the basic set. So the basic set in Magic has cards come and go with every rotation change which I think is something Hearthstone needs to start doing and probably will do in this next expansion. So maybe like a set that says, hey, these cards from the last year that rotated out are moving into the, um, well, you can't call it Legends, right, or whatever, the, but like... Uh, the Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame, whatever they called it. Well, the Hall of Fame would be oh, cards so that are out, so you'd need like a... The basic the all stars, right? Like the all star set. These are going to stay in standard, even though they're right. not in sets anymore. Yeah. So, like, you know, giving Snow Chugger back to Mage for some reason. That's a really bad example, but a card that came off the top of my head. You know, it's it's a question of like, what do they care about the idea of the classic set being 
you know, like evergreen and constantly a feature of the game, right? Like, because like you say, certain cards from Classic are just in every deck forever. It's like, okay, mages are always running Frostbolts, always running Fireballs. Warlocks are running Doom Guards, And then you have, you know, Flame Imp and you know, this kind of stuff where, okay, if you play this game a lot, you get really tired of seeing someone hit you with a Doom Guard for the 77th time, right? Well, I think that's, I mean, that's one of the things, like, you're seeing it a lot now. Like, I think in this last set, the Shaman Legendary is one of the strongest cards they've ever made in Hearthstone. The six mana, seven, seven elemental that returns all of your minions to your hand and they cost one mana. Oh, like, yeah. I think that's, I think that's the, one of the strongest cards they've ever made in Hearthstone. And it sees zero play because Shaman's just unplayable now because they were propped up for two years by good expansion cards. And their base set is just utter garbage. Right. So like, the expansion have, cards rotated into their base set. Correct. Because we're gonna have we're gonna have that issue again. Where, I don't know if you remember like last expansion, Warlock was unplayable, and this set they gave Warlock like three of the best cards in the set, and so now Warlock's gonna be a contender deck for the next two years because it has this very very strong core card set, and then. Once those rotate out, you're going to go back to the issue where if nothing else new was updated, they're going to be back to being garbage or stuck to, you know, just a minion-based zoo deck. It's like, do they want to keep fixing the same problems with these classes over and over again, you know, in the course of years? Like, oh, th this year it's the Hunter and Mage's turn, or this year it's the Warlock's and Priest's turn, or whatever. Like, do they want that to be the cycle of the game? That's kind of a... It seems like a bad way to look at the balance of the game. Right, and like I, like I said, I, I, have, I have big faith, especially given all the changes they've announced, including this and the other one I'm sure we're going to talk about, that this announcement is coming for the next set. I would hope so. But let's get to the next one, the big change. The change that everyone thought it would make me start playing the game again. <laughs> Hearthstone's ladder mode is changing, which is uh, like the ranked play version of the game where you go in and play for ranks uh, and um, essentially before you dropped at the end of every season you would drop back your achieved rank minus or you took your achieved rank and subtracted it from 25 or something like that is that how it worked um, subtracting yeah subtract your highest rank reached from 25 was the old system so the newest system is you take your highest rank from 25 to legend and at the end of the season you just drop back four yes rather than getting like two stars a rank yeah it would essentially be like every rank you got you earned some number of stars and then those stars would propel you forward to like up to rank 15 or something i think if you got all the way to legend so or like 16, 16 three star i think is where you ended up before yeah and so that's literally you know from 25 to 16 is every player in the game and then you know in theory the players that belong at legend would play some games and and win their way up there in the first couple weeks and then it would kind of be spread back out but it really created this clustering problem in the middle and lower ranks where like you would be playing people at rank 20 you know sort of the base kind of level uh, after they implemented all the floors and you'd be playing against people that are literally playing the, the full meta deck of like, you know, a completely competitive deck straight out of the tournaments at the lowest level rank. And like, why is that person there? They clearly don't deserve to be at that rank. And I can imagine it being supremely frustrating for a new player. Or even returning players, because you get that cluster that makes that ma it makes the ladder extremely competitive for like the first week and a half of it, and then at that point, a lot of people I imagine don't even care. Yeah, so it just sort of emphasizes that grind aspect of the game, which is really not the fun part of Hearthstone. I think we all agree on that. So like having here's, having here's to play question. hundreds and hundreds of games is not great. Here's my question. How does this remove the grind from the game? I, I think it removes the grind because it adds a real progression system to the ladder now. It just makes because it so I don't have to play against legend players, but it doesn't remove the grind from the game. Well, it's, it's it, you're never... The ladder, in essence, is just a giant 
wind farm simulator, right? Like you just need to have a 51% win rate to get legend in theory. So, I mean, it's designed in that way to be a grind no matter what. But in this sense, if you get more than four ranks in a season, at the start of the next season, you're higher than you started the last season. So you're growing. You're you're actually progressing. Right. And that's the idea that you can actually make progress over multiple seasons as opposed to having to get your 300 wins that you need or whatever in, in the, the course, course of one season, season in, in one month. month. You can now spread that out over, over the course, course of six months, months or whatever, whatever as, as you gradually learn to play, play the game, game better. And in theory, from the get-go at the start of a ladder season, you're facing opponents of your skill level at the end of last month. So that it's more balanced in the skill level, so you should be able to grind to whatever your current skill level is easier. And you can get to opponents of your skill level along the way. So like as you're growing as a player, you're facing opponents of a similar skill level not logging in and then finding, you know, three players in a row that were legend last season right away. Right. I have roughly a skill level of rank three, right, when I was playing this game. So... And, and, I, and I would argue that rank five to legend is all the same skill level. It just takes time. Mm, okay. It, there's a skill in... uh not getting on tilt and falling backwards where you can't get win streaks to save your season. Correct, correct. Yes, totally. that, is, that is a big skill. <laughs> Which, uh, I've, you know, I've tanked a season from three to seven on tilt, so. My question, well, the though. Good, the good news is they confirmed from this, that they just, I think they just had a tweet about it today, that it's going to be whatever your highest rank was of the season. So if my, you get to rank three and do the full tilt to rank seven, you're not going to rank eleven. You're going to rank seven. My question though is: this is isn't this going to just stagnate the ladder further? What, at a certain point, most players are going to hit their skill cap or time cap. Either way, you want to see it, right? Right. Uh, um, and they won't be able to just play for fifty-one percent wins to p- keep progressing. So players may be more like myself or or JJ would get to rank three or four, fall back to seven, get to rank three or four, fall back to seven, and just make that their treadmill instead of, you know, 21 to to four or so. Well, and feel like they, you're progressing more. It's not going to... They are think unifying... That, they, they're, they're unifying the, um, the ranks. So every rank now from 25 to ladder or to legend is going to be five stars where before it was like two, three, four, and then five once you got to like rank 15 or whatever. Um, so in that sense, if you, you know, hit your time cap, if you want to call it, at, at at rank three, but you had to go all the way from rank 25 to rank three to get there, the next season starts, you get put at rank seven, and you hit your time cap again, maybe you end up at rank one. And the next season you start off at rank five. And so you're just getting a little closer every time with the same time cap. Assuming you're getting more than four ranks in that time. I see what you're trying to say, Andrew. And you're, it's probably true. But then that also then allows you to say, oh, okay, well, I, I know how much time I have available to spend on this game, right? It's a, like a certain limited amount of time. I'm playing against people who are the same skill level as me. I only know I can, you know, reasonably get out, you know, 75 games this month or or 50 games, right? So that means that's how many I can get for the entire month. And, you know, however many of those are wins and losses is just enough to get me those four ranks, right? And you kind of just end on that unending treadmill of going up four and then down four kind of a thing. But at least the you would, in theory, now be doing this with less overall games than in order to attain that spot every single month in the previous system. So you could actually get to rank three in 50 games, Right, whereas before you never could. It took a, an investment of like a hundred games in order to get there, or you know whatever. So it, it kind of makes the, it kind of lets you get out of it whatever you're willing to put in, right? Well, that's how it, I see it. It also seems like it might be an inducement for people who either have given up on the ladder, like Andy, or people who have never join the ladder in the first place because they don't feel like they have the time for it, right? If you're just going to fall all the way back down again and you don't have the time to devote to it, then, you know, 
I'm sure there's a crowd of people who aren't going to get over that initial hurdle to even start, and now they might consider jumping into it and saying, well, if I only have to put in so much time to get five levels higher, and I can slowly work my way up, maybe it's worth my time now. I I see that argument, and I definitely look at it as uh, another interesting change, Michael, that you didn't hear, and one that maybe... Uh, adds to your narrative is that they also changed the card back from achieving rank 20 to just five wins. Okay. Um, which I think is kind of interesting. I feel like it doesn't really push people that hard. Um, if five wins at rank 25 is I can do it with my eyes closed and a free to play account. It's, it's five games <laughs> generally at, at rank 25, right? Yeah. So and, it might be roughly the same, I guess. You know, for a good player or a player who has played a lot of the game, but for a new player, maybe it would be quite a bit more, right? And so in this case, you know, a person who has never played the game before is starting out fresh at rank 25 has a lot more incentive to play past that, you know, second or third game where they get crushed to go, oh, okay, like now I can learn some stuff. I only need to get two more wins and I can get that card back this season. But, well, and also, but, in theory, new player experience-wise, rank 25 should be a lot more equally skill-matched with new players with minimal collections. Sure. But yes, somebody, also that. somebody that's good at math, peep, peep my argument here, right? Like, I'm a decent player of Hearthstone if I decided to start playing this game again, which I've considered considering this ladder change. But in my estimation... I am better than most of the players mid-season that are below rank 10. Like, significantly better, enough that I could have a 65 to 75% win rate below those ranks and shoot up the ladder real fast. Okay. okay. Players that are at Legend, maybe in the March season, or, yeah, this goes into effect in March, so then the April season will fall back to four. Players that don't reach Legend, which are people that are mostly either grinders or that I would be of equal or better skill than would also then fall back down the ladder. It would seem to me that the uh, stayed inflation of people, you would have your best chance to shoot back up and past the ranks that will eventually just become a floating death pool of 50% wins only in the season right away after those legend players move back down the first time. Am I wrong about that? Well, you're just talking about the first time it goes into effect, right? Yeah. Essentially, it seems like the first time it would go into effect is the is the time you would have the most stratified tiers. Or am I wrong? Well, no, because that's, in theory, how it's going to be every season from then on out. I have to imagine they have analytics showing how many actual new players they get, you know? So it's probably going to be fairly consistent. I guess I just don't understand how it's any harder the or how it's any easier the first time than subsequent times. Are you just saying because you think there's going to be like an inflation of people trending towards the top? I would think then you would want to wait because the more people that are up there, the more likely some of them are bad. I guess that's a fair argument too because in theory you should be getting more legend players every season now. Assuming that's that people are going to trend upwards like that. It's possible that they don't, right? Like that people just aren't willing to invest that many time, that much more time than already are doing it. Yeah. I'm not good at math. I mean, I'm not either, and they didn't really release a lot of numbers to do. You know, I mean, there's sites like um, Vicious Syndicate that do, you know, sort of math-based stuff based on reported games, but I don't think anyone really knows the numbers of the the latter other than Blizzard. You gotta, I guess we just gotta kind of let Blizzard take the wheel on this and hope that they know <laughs> what they're doing, right? Thrall, take the wheel. Kind of, uh, like, I don't know. Yeah, there's, there's you know, there's sort of, we can, you know, debate the ideas of it, but there's really no numbers out there to sure. say one way or the other. I'm unconvinced it's, uh, ch it's change to the ladder effect for legend players will be great. I'm unconvinced of the change to non-legend players. Oh, I'll tell you, immediately it'll have an effect just because la legend players will not be in the pool. Yeah, so the the thing that I'm most excited for is that when it goes into effect, I can begin trying to seriously gain ranks 
at the beginning of the season as opposed to needing to wait like a week for all the legend players to kind of shoot up past me. Oh, uh, you lose your vacation. I mean, I'm going to be honest. My mentality is get to rank five and stop. Right, right exactly. Get my free, just get my free epic. Because I don't want to deal with the grind every season to get to legend. So for me, starting at rank nine compared to rank 16 or 17, whatever, is massive. Totally. And that's like the thing that I think is a good out of this, right? Like you can get whatever you are willing to set as your own goal. It feels like because you're not reset as far down, there's a lot less that you need to do in order to get up to, you know, where you want to set that goal. Like, you know, the, the, the between five and legend time is going to be the same as it ever has been because those are going to be the same people. It's the same group of really good players all trying to get to legend in there. Well, okay, so that part doesn't change, but if you can just start right there at rank four, you know, get the hard part of the season out of the way immediately, and then people get to have fun when they get to legend or, you know, what, or when we get to rank five or 10 or, you know, whatever. And it just seems good. That's that part about it seems good to me. Yeah, that we combined with the, you know, the rank floors or ceilings they added. I mean, they're slowly getting there. All right. I think it's a wait and see type of moment, and uh, we'll have to wait and see. I would like to do something special right now. There are four, three and a half people on this podcast that love RPGs. Yeah. yeah. Did JJ finish? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> no. <laughs> He's so close, though. We did have a discussion last week. He's about 70 hours in. But it's, I, it's, close to, it's like, like 75, 75 now. now. Oh, well, there you go. Um, I think it's time to sound off on what everyone, uh, what everyone's RPGing because I think there's a heavy load of RPG action happening. Or at least we can talk some Xenoblade and some... What is it, Michael? Uh, the Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky. Yeah. Also known as the uh, Kiseki series in Japanese. Uh... I love those games. Uh, Trails in the Sky FC, right? First chapter, I think, is where Michael is. Yes, yeah, I just, I'm a couple hours into it, uh, and it's uh, it's unforgiving, let's say. Oh man, are you playing on like a difficult mode? No, no, I, uh, I started off in just the normal mode, um, but in one of the, the first quests, you have to go save some kids from a tower. And there's definitely a wrong turn you can take on the path. Hmm. And you know it's a wrong turn because all of a sudden everything is out to kill you. <laughs> the, uh, I don't remember them being particularly brutal, but uh, the thing I do remember about those games is that how amazingly they do towns and NPCs and like just random villagers. Because every time you finish a main, like a quest on your board or in your notebook in that game, the dialogue in the town updates to reflect it. Like, did you just save the miners from the town? Well, now the miners are back around and every single person in the town comments on it. And then the next quest you do there to like clean out the, you know, old house or whatever, it, everyone has a comment about that. And people's little NPC stories where the kid is lost and trying to find his mom will update as they as those things progress to give you sort of a really cool sense of the town evolving. The I thing, like that. It's not the, the early game NPCs are still commenting on that, that first cat you saved out of a tree at the end of the game when you come back. Correct, yeah. They will actually ha you can walk all the way back to that first town at the end of the game and they will have comments about the big goings-on in the capital or whatever. I think the Fable games did that, but I don't think that it's very common, and that's one of the things that always bothered me about the most about uh, especially MMOs, um, unless you had some sort of instanced version of Towns or whatever. It was basically always the same there. Right, and this is kind of the the old-school version of instancing. Uh, where, you know, all the townsfolk will have their own little storylines or whatever play out. And, you know, the lost minor father will come back and make up with his wife. And, you know, then they will go on a trip to a different town or something later in the game. Is it kind of the standard Final Fantasy layout party-wise and combat-wise? 
Um, party wise, I I haven't gotten far enough to know what the the cap on numbers is, but combat wise, it's more like tactics. Oh. I so you're that. set up on a grid. You can only move so far. You've got a, a range for your attacks and your magic. Um, so you have to kind of strategize your movement to make the best use of your talents and stay out of enemy range. And now this is not mm-hmm. a short series, right? Like how I'm, there's there's a new game coming out. Uh, yeah. So so. FC, the game that Michael is playing, uh, first chapter is the first chapter. There's a there's an SC, which is the second chapter. There's a game called Trails in the Sky, the third, which is the third one. And that sort of comprises sort of one trilogy of games. Uh, there is There are two untranslated games uh, in between that and the next set of games uh, that haven't come over to the U.S. ever. Uh, and then there's a, a new set of games uh, called Trails of Cold Steel that take place in a different part of the world, but kind of concurrently to some of the stuff that is happening in that first trilogy and that second, uh, is duology a word, uh, set of games. And uh, the the Trails of Cold Steel series uh, came out on PC uh, just last year, I think. And the sequel, Trails of Cold Steel 2, is coming out in February. Uh, both of those games have been on, like, PS3 and Vita and stuff for quite a while. Oh, Vita. Every time I hear your name. Uh, but these are the PC versions uh, supposedly coming out. And I don't Michael, have you made use of the Turbo feature? Uh, only a little bit. Um, mostly so. I made use of it mostly at the beginning because in, uh, in trying to get, um, my settings right. And you know how it is when you're, you're trying to configure the settings on a game you've set up for the first time. True. I discovered that if I have it in full screen mode and go to, um, tab my window into another program. Oh no. If I, if I try and come back, it just kills the game. Mm, so that's bad. Fifteen minutes of intro in when I went to check something else and realized there was no way to get back. I uh, yeah, I turboed my way through that the second time. Can Ryan, you imagine you know if this... it would like if they had an old school like troll NPC in the game telling you to open up the party menu test type Alta Four? <laughs> Ouch. The... And literally all the turbo feature is you just hold down a button and everything in the game moves at like four times speed or whatever. It's like you all can the Final it. Fantasy remakes they've been coming out with. Yeah, exactly. They have those on right, the Final Fantasy similar. remakes? Yeah. They, 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 well, like, they like, I, I got the Final Fantasy IX on my phone like a few years ago and they literally have like a god mode button you can activate oh, at any point in time. Yeah, it's like just you never wanna... take any damage. If you just want to play through the story, you turn on God mode and you can level one the entire game, like cakewalk through it. What's the point? Yeah, I, I thought that was very strange, and it's like built into the base form of the game. But yeah, they have like a turbo mode where you can like go everything like four x speed. Can I use that so, in a speed run? Probably. Uh, not. Yeah, probably not. Uh, but the thing that's nice here is that it works in both battle and on the map, so your character will run, you know, at like four times speed or whatever. But it stops when there are like button prompts or things that need you to input stuff. So you're not going to accidentally like overrun yourself through a conversation or, you know, accidentally hit B when you're supposed to hit A for the quick time event or whatever. Yeah, best part. Yeah, it is intelligent enough to know. And you can decide, oh, I really want the battles to speed up only two times and the field stuff where I'm running around the map to be, like, five times. And their little configuration utility lets you set that stuff, uh, which is really cool. So I take this all to mean that you did not also at the same time start up Xenoblade. I did not get back into it, no. (laughs) So it is is still on my to-do list. (laughs) Ryan, last week we did a recap of some uh, of the Xenoblade patches. Did you have a standout uh, favorite for the new update to the game? No, you mean the disappointment for the new game. What? for For the patch. They got rid of the best voice lines in the game. We did comment about that. Like, how are we going to remember anyone if they don't tell us to forget them? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, he said not to forget him, but you now he has been forgotten. <laughs> I, I guess I thought I could take him. Yep. Uh, the I I still will say though that the one button press to take you directly to the fast travel map where your character already is. Why did they not have that in the base game? <laughs> have you? taken time from ff14 to drop back into xenoblade or are you just done i i actually had a really interesting thought today like literally today that i feel like if the switch had an achievement system i would be going back to xenoblade and like 100 percenting every blades affinity chart and doing like more in the post game stuff but right now i just have no real motivation to do it and it feels weird that my only motivation would be just a random achievement that means nothing. But that well, was my thought. No, I mean, that that's kind of proven to be effective. Like, the Xbox and the PlayStation definitely have them, and they got so popular that people were hacking them and all that. It's, it's I think, like, Breath of the Wild and some of the newer games have in-game achievements that you can get. But there definitely isn't one for the system. How do you guys feel about that? Does Nintendo need to jump into the achievement game to keep their console current? Or should they just stay out of it? I kind of feel like maybe they just stay above the fray on the I, I'm a, I'm a big believer in faith. I, I think I think we're getting it in the next direct with like the system overhaul and internet announcement. I think that's coming. I yeah. would be fine without it. I mean, it's March is a year. Wow. It still needs its internet functionality and stuff that was supposed to come 2018 or start of 2018 or whatever. So I assume that's getting announced mm -hmm. whenever they have the first direct of the year. And JJ, you said you're okay without it. Yeah, I, I'm fine. I don't need there to be the achievements uh, in that sort of stuff. Mostly, uh, at least in the case of Xenoblade 2, because I someday want to play other games. <laughs> well, I, I know, right? You're, you're asking me why I'm not playing more, and I'm like, I already got a 140-hour game clock. What more do you want out of me? Yeah, I mean, the game is so, like, there's so much to do, and not all of it maybe is, like, good content but there is so much in there that if you wanted yeah easily hundreds of hours if you wanted to do literally everything i probably know your response to this but one of the changes was tiger tiger related has that made it bearable or have you not even tried uh i've played some of it yeah um i, I did the uh some of the extra game quest related stuff uh to that character um but i'm not using them regularly in my like main party of characters so I'm not very incentivized to go do more of it. Um, I, I mostly just want more field skills, so I've been doing that and kind of stopping immediately when the field skills are good. And swapping out, trying to find the right combination. Oh my god. I want to open this chest, but it needs four lock picking and three earth mastery. Let me go find a guy who has earth mastery and put him on. Wait till you find the ones that need, like, earth mastery nine, and you're like, okay, one second, I can find enough of these. Yeah, I've had a couple of those. I just, like, fill every person who has blades with Earth people and hope that it's enough. Do you have, like, I, don't, I haven't looked into this, but do you have, like, only a certain amount of room for blades? Or is this just some sort of infinite scrolling list that goes uh, on forever? You can have three equipped per character, and there is a max number total all of your characters can have, and the total pool combined between them. But there's some side thing in the game you can do that gradually increases the cap. And also, that cap is so big, I have yet to hit it in, like, 70 hours of playing. Uh, Mostly because I just got bored of watching the opening animations. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just opening 99 rare blades here and not getting a single rare one and got to clear out my entire list for hours. Yeah, I have, like, 99 common crystals all the time, and then I open all the rare ones I get and kind of am just like, okay, and I still don't have even close to all of them. New Game Plus is coming. So wait, wait, so we think the yep. switch, we think the switch is getting a a big update this year. I'm I'm out of the loop on this one, Michael I, Ryan. Uh, well, it's uh, it's getting the internet update, so I assume that has to be some infrastructure behind it to change the UI and everything. Yeah, and there have been uh, since back in the fall, there have been um, different indie devs who have been talking about an achievement system coming. Whoa, wait, what? So that's kind of confirmed. And it's not confirmed, uh, not officially by Nintendo, but um, you know, take it take it for what it's worth from outside developers talking about how uh, achievements are are coming. Well, they've definitely been more open 
to letting indie developers into the system, seeing what's happening, and that's kind of, I think, why they've got more games oh, coming I mean, ever. Yeah, they've been killing it with indie developers. So, that's trustworthy, I guess. I mean... But the, the only issue is Nintendo doesn't announce anything. They tell you, we got a presentation in two hours, and they announce cardboard boxes, so... You hold, don't hold know what you're going to get. Hold on. We we should talk some Labo. Cardboard? This is Nintendo Cardboard. It's just like, it's literally that. Okay, in all honesty, did you see the robot one, though? It comes like, with, like, pulleys. I, with, it's got the rubber bands or whatever for the haptic feedback. That's kind of genius. It, I'm not saying it's not genius. I'm just confused. Like, did someone ask for this? Where did, like, this is just, like, the complete left field. It's for years people have been saying Nintendo was thinking outside the box, and finally Nintendo's like, "Oh yeah, now we're thinking the box." I'm not sad if this is also a replacement in the long run for things like gun cons and you know, like game specific controllers and stuff like that. If they can cardboard those things too, that could be kind of cool. This does not appear to be that though. Yeah. I mean, this appears to be a game thing where you build a piano or a robot or a crazy, like, spider-looking thing that you put your Switch in, which, why would you do this, and play around with it. I don't, it doesn't, to me, look like a actual, like, peripheral, uh, like, housing, right? Yeah, long. It's not. It's not a long term thing. It's just some random idea they had that because they're making that crazy switch money now. They're like, okay, print the cardboard boxes. These things are what eighty bucks a pop. I didn't see the price on them. I I think the base one is fifty, which is the one that comes with like the fishing game, the little RC car thing you can turn it into, the piano and like all that. The majority of the stuff they showed, and then the robot game thing is a completely different Labo set for like seventy dollars. Yeah. I want to say I saw the price was like sixty nine ninety nine, and it comes out on four twenty. That joke aside, since you just <laughs> left it there to hang, I y'all didn't <laughs> y'all didn't pick up what I was putting down. That's your fault, not mine. Okay. The other interesting thing to consider is if you order it on Amazon, you'll get six times as much Labo as you ordered because it comes in too much cardboard. <laughs> you can make a yeah, whole so other robot. Did... They did say that they are going to provide the directions online, like basically stencils that you could print out, because that's all this is. This is like stenciled cardboard, and if you want to use your Amazon boxes, you just print out all these stencils and use an X-Acto knife or whatever and, and cut out replacement parts from your Amazon boxes. Yeah, that's, that's only going to be a replacement, though, because you need, like, it's coming with, like, some actual physical game also. Right, right, yeah, so, yeah. You, so would you would need the, the original, original thing, thing to start, to start with. with. Unless you, Unless you just want to build the sweet robot backpack, backpack and, and have no rubber, rubber bands, bands or whatever. whatever. Does anyone want to challenge my prediction that these things are sold out? Oh, like, are you kidding me? These are going to go, yeah. like, crazy. Yeah, this is... It seems like people are way into it. And I mean, like, it's whatever. It's something goofy and weird. I'm all for this type of stuff. That's That is Nintendo, right? We're just going to throw something random out and see how it sticks. You can buy a $200 Vive or a $50 cardboard box. What's your VR adventure? (laughs) (laughs) Or, like, I don't even know that they're going to do VR with it. They're just going to, like, make you wear a crazy visor so you feel more like a robot. Well, yeah, they're doing it more like the augmented reality stuff rather than VR, which is a different way, but, you know, cool. I don't know that I trust sticking my Switch in a bunch of cardboard in front of my face. Yeah, that's the like more scary part. It's like, oh, like, I didn't your whole attach system. the hooks. I didn't attach the hooks well on the back of my head. Oops, it fell. Was I the <laughs> only person who who had that thought when they announced the Dark Souls remaster on the Switch? I'm like, oh, that's amazing, okay. but that's a horrible idea. Everyone's gonna break their Switch. <laughs> <laughs> I saw. I did see a video of somebody playing Super Meat Boy on the Switch, and he opened up his trash can and just dropped the Switch in it. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I feel like I'm more likely to break the switch because I'm being a sweet robot dude and punching too hard rather than because I got really mad at how bad I suck at Meat Boy. But maybe that's just me. I mean, that's a possibility. So the switch is a year old. 
I know that it's still within its hardware life and all that, but with a major overhaul of the UI, is there a chance for a hardware update to the Switch? Not Maybe not like internal, but like I, maybe for people like me with gigantic hands that can't hold those Joy-Cons? It's, if you look at Nintendo's track record with their handheld units... They always have, you know, the DSi, the new 3DS, that type of thing. So I think it's highly likely that two years down the line, we get some sort of enhanced graphics switch, even if it's just somehow built into the dock. So you get a better dock that can improve resolution or performance output on games specifically while docked. I will say, Andrew, the controllers are actually pretty fine as long as you put them in like either the cradle thing that they come with. Um, or use them attached to the system. If you try to hold the single Joy-Con by itself, I really think there's no way to get around it being tiny and impossible to use. I love, I loved holding the Joy-Con separate. I, when I first got Breath of the Wild, I was just laying in my bed, sprawled out with like my hands on opposite ends, just playing the game. Uh, no, 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 no. I don't mean that way. I mean the you player one gets one Joy-Con and player two gets the other one. Oh yeah, that's that's yeah. never I, happening. I, I think basically that's an <laughs> unfixable problem. Uh. Re- you just need to buy a pro controller or something and use it if you really hate those the way those things feel. I mean, I would recommend a pro controller for everyone. I also would. Um, but yeah, I think that part of the problem is unfixable. But I mean, yeah, it's possible they build, oh, here's the upgraded Switch dock, which just does upscaling or something or, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know that that's coming for a couple of years at least, though. I mean, it's literally one year old. Why would they... Why would they kill the gravy train? It's doing good. Let it go. The moment they release the Virtual Console, the Switch is going to be even more crazy than it was because they can put every Wii game on it instantly. Oh, everything from... Well, how do they handle... They'd have to port a lot of the DS and Wii U games, but they'd have a team to do that. I assume they would still make money on those, right? Well, yeah, and I, I imagine because like, the Wii U had an extensive Virtual Console, I assume all that data is still somewhere, right? You just flip a Switch and it's available for the Switch now, right? Yeah. What the- oh, they're not going to do that, though. They want you to buy again, man. Triple dip, quadruple dip. Yeah, I was well, just no, I about mean, to I ask. Mean, just have the, have the actual like library to, to buy available instantly. I was just about to yeah. ask, does anyone think that there's a chance that they'll say, well, you bought this game on X system and now you have it on your Switch? Zero percent chance. That's my very hot prediction right there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I agree. I don't hear a lot of rousing support I, yeah, I, to the opposite. I, don't. I mean, there's there's no incentive for them to give it away for free, right? True, yeah, and if people are willing to you, buy it again. Yeah, you've already got it, so there's no incentive for them to give it to you again. If you really want to play it for free that badly, you can go back and play the old version. And I guess if we're only talking about Wii U install base versus Switch install base, there's not that many people that are going to piss off. Right, the Switch has already passed the Wii U install base. So, all right. Well, before we go, I think that someone here has to fess up and tell us how good it is to have a Millennium Falcon the size of a dinner table in their apartment. Uh, it it uh, currently makes the room I'm sitting in a little more cramped. I can't lean back too far in the chair I'm sitting in, or I risk uh, I risk tipping it over. I hate to put you on the spot, but is it complete? <laughs> um, it is. Almost complete. I was missing one piece in the build. Out of how uh, which You just didn't which have I, it? I, it just was not in the bag that it was supposed to be in, nor was it in any of the successive bags. Shouldn't have shopped at Ikea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, it's uh, it's pretty amazing. I mean, the one piece is cosmetic, and, you know, over 7,500 pieces that they only missed one. I'm, I'll, I'll let that slide. You can probably get at them on the internet, and they'll send it to you. Uh, yeah, I already did. They have a, a website, a missing piece page on the Lego website, where you just fill in the set number and the piece number that you're missing, and they'll mail it to you. Do I know 7,500 people that I could get to go fill in a missing piece thing so they wouldn't catch on? <laughs> Genius. If you do, you know what? I think the hat's off to you, man. <laughs> yeah. One piece slow. a month. You'll get there eventually. Way to slow play it. <laughs> At like 85 years old, Andrew puts the last piece on and is like, finally! <laughs> I just have a picture of Michael walking by that room every evening. Just crack the door a little bit, look in, you know, make sure everything's still okay in there. 
kind of just just the fatherly figure checking on his his little. Baby. <laughs> I hope he doesn't have any cats. That's why I have to open the door because they are not allowed in this room. That was a clear. He has cats. <laughs> I followed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. That's enough for today. I think Hearthstone really took a bite out of it, but uh, we got to a lot of stuff. It was good. I'm, I'm happy to hear everybody's having fun in the RPG land. And uh, I was really hoping to talk about some Nintendo cardboard. I'm glad we did. So thanks, Ryan, for joining us. No problem. As always, uh, it's really fun to have you on talking Blizz games as well as Xenoblade. And hopefully we'll have you back soon. And uh, as always, my partner in crime, JJ, over there and, and Michael as well. JJ, where can people get at us? Tell us all the things we uh, didn't think about with the Hearthstone changes. Yeah, they can follow us on the internet at We Were Gamers uh, on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Uh, we also have an email if you want to email into this podcast, podcast at wewergamers.com, a real email address that we read. It's uh, episode 91, and we haven't thanked him in a while. Marley Rosner, thank you for our intro outro music. I'll probably remember to do it in another 25 episodes or so. Yeah, uh, bless up. Get that guy a website, somebody so that we can send them there. And uh, we really need to develop a tagline for this show rather than just coming out of it like a bunch of apples. <laughs> <laughs> eh. <laughs> there it is. Print it. <laughs> <laughs>